All right, good morning and welcome to Jersey Shore Baptist Church. If you stand with us this morning, we'll turn to 507. 507, come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Strings of mercy never ceasing. All for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet, sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it. choir comes up. Special, Special group comes up. Stripped of his garments and oppressed 
I am loved and accepted, and I wear a robe of righteousness. His life for mine, His life for mine. How could it ever be that He would die, God's Son would die? He gave his life for mine. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, come to your prayer. Preserve, wash me in your blood, Lord. Help us as we um, come together and hear about you, Lord Jesus. Fill power, fill past with your power, Lord Jesus. Uh, help us all to leave here changed. Help us all to honor and glorify you in everything we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, our second song, number 118, 118, I Need Thee Every Hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. Praise the Lord. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, I want to thank all of you who were praying for my mom. Uh, God answered your prayers. She's healed. She's in heaven. And so praise the Lord for that, and we thank the Lord for heaven. If we really believe what we say we believe, uh, heaven is a far greater place than this earth is. Amen. And she had a good run of it on earth here, but uh, she's in heaven now. And so we're looking forward to seeing her again someday. But I can't be uh, any more excited for her as I am she got to see my dad, and uh, she got to see the Lord, and so it's just a it's just a win win for her. And so praise the Lord for that. And there's some information in the bulletin. Anybody who's interested in attending the funeral service, it's up in Bricktown. It'll be Saturday at noontime. And so if you're interested in coming, we would love to see you there for that. I'm sure, my family would appreciate it as well. Um, Pray for Isan. Isan's at Bayview Baptist Church preaching there this morning. Wade was actually supposed to preach there this morning, but uh, Stephanie took sick. And so uh, just to be safe, um, Wade didn't want to, you know, show up anywhere in case, uh, in case he has the virus or whatever. And so uh, anyway, so pray for Wade. He's home and, and with Stephanie. 
and pray about all these COVID cases. The COVID cases are ramping back up again and everybody's getting nervous about COVID. Please do whatever you need to do to be safe. If you feel more comfortable wearing a mask, wear a mask. If you don't feel comfortable wearing a mask, you don't have to wear one. But let's just you know, try to keep a little bit of distance from each other while this thing is, is rampant. Thankfully, most of the people, I mean, uh, uh, people that are getting it, um, I, most of them have either been vaccinated or have had the virus or both and they're fortunately mild cases, so included in that number are some very, very mild cases, but there are also some people that are getting very sick, so uh, let's be in prayer about that. I don't wanna shut down ever again, and so just pray that we can just try to keep this thing away from the church as much as possible. Um, camp was, junior camp was off for a little while because of the COVID virus. Uh, the camp, camp Calvary, the camp we use for junior camp, said that they're not, having, they're not gonna have camp this year, they canceled camp. But within a few hours, we found another camp, and it's actually the camp that the teenagers use, which is High Point Camp, um, which is a very beautiful camp as well. Great camp, and the teenagers use that every year for teen camp. So anyway, High Point has opened up their camp to us for the same price and everything else. So junior camp is back on. So maybe you got news that it was off, well, it's back on again. And so if you're interested in junior camp, there's some brochures over there. Uh, Sammy is gonna have the, um, the uh, permission forms and all that. We're gonna have a meeting after church tonight uh, for anybody that's interested. I said this morning, that we were gonna leave at 10 o'clock. I just looked at that form, uh, check-in time's at noon, so we gotta leave, or it's 11 o'clock, uh, according to that form, look at that form. But anyway, so we're gonna leave earlier, nine o'clock, so we're just gonna make the decision, we're gonna leave earlier at nine o'clock. So just if, if whoever, maybe you know somebody that's planning on going to junior camp, let's get the word out to them that we're gonna have to leave a little bit earlier. Um, also, if you notice over there next to Larry, there's a big uh, organ over there. Uh, we praise the Lord for that. We were praying for a new piano. God gave us a new piano, and we were praying for an organ, and God gave us an organ, and that organ uh, was donated by uh, Brother Stahl's sister, Ruthie, and she's not a member of our church. She attends now and again, but she's uh, not a member of our church, but uh, Miss Camilla went over and checked it out, and she said it's a beautiful organ, and it's a very good organ, and so, um, so we, she decided that it would be beneficial for us to have that. Uh, we have Vince, who plays the organ. I'm sure there's some other people that can play the organ as well, but Vince plays the organ. And uh, so we're gonna get it all set up for him because he's blind, he, we gotta get it set up, we gotta get all the buttons pushed in the right spots, but once they're set, he can play it. And so, and it's just an amazing thing to me that Vince, who can't see, never could see anything, born blind, just picks that stuff up and can just play. It's just, it's incredible. So anyway, we should get that up and running here pretty soon. Um, also wanna make mention of the fact that um, Brother Derek and Miss Misty are here, and um, they, we've known Derek for quite a while. Misty's been here on occasion as well, but they live out in Ohio, and uh, Derek has been working out at the power plant, and so he would be at our church, you know, about every other weekend on average. Typically on Wednesday night, he would be here as well, but he got a permanent job out here, so they're gonna be moving out our way. So we're very, very excited about that. Yeah, praise the Lord. He, he mentioned to me that uh, you texted him a couple days ago and asked him what was going on. And I, and I said, well, it's just like every other announcement that's made. We've been announcing it, but uh, people are just kind of zoned out during announcements. They don't, they don't ever hear the announcements. You might have been outside when I mentioned it or whatever. We have been mentioning it. But we're very excited about them uh, being part of the church services and everything else. All right, um, that's all the little extra announcements we have. We're thrilled that you're here. If you're visiting with us, whether it's in here or online, uh, we'd love to get to know you a little bit better. And there's a, there's a tab on our website that says My Response. And if you click on that, give us whatever information, mainly you just have to give us your email address. And uh, we'll communicate back and forth with you, let you know what's going on here. We'll um, you know, answer any questions you might have about the church or about salvation or any question you might have at all. And so we're excited that you're here with us. All right, we're going to sing a song. And this is not in your hymn book, so we're just going to go off the screens. Lord, I lift your name on high. If you stand with us this morning as we sing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Cross my dead to pay from the cross to the grave. 
from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Let's sing that one more time. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross, my dead to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Good morning, everybody. We're going to be in Jude for our scripture reading. Once again, we're going to be in Jude, and we're going to read from verse 5 to verse 7, and, uh, or I'll read verse 5 to verse 7, and then all together we'll close up with verse 11. And so once again, I'll start in Jude chapter, or verse 5, not chapter, verse 5, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. And the angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities, uh, round, or cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Verse 11, altogether, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. May the Lord bless the reading of his word as we sing another song. All right, our next song is 345. 345, what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain. Take thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. All right, you may be seated. And we'll just go through a few announcements. We've started the Faith Bible Institute, which is a Bible course designed for any Christian looking to deepen their knowledge of the Bible. The classes began August 19th, and the deadline for sign-up is August 27th. If you have any questions, you can see um, Brother Wade for that. Also, we started up the bus ministry. We're excited um, to start it up and to get back um, up and running in the bus. 
And if you're interested in being a part of this awesome ministry, see uh, Brother Kyle Bacaro. And then we have junior camp. Pastor already mentioned we'll leave tomorrow at 9 a.m. If you wanted to help out at all, you can mark it on the offering envelope and put it in the offering. Um, and then we have the missionary, uh, Mark Helzerman, who's coming August 25th, which is this Wednesday. He's our missionary to Papua New Guinea and will be uh, joining us. He'll give us an update. So we're looking forward to that. Also, Pastor mentioned um, that his mother passed away. And uh, the funeral is going to be the 29th of August, which is this Saturday. And, um, or, sorry, 28th, which is this Saturday. It's going to be at um, Brick Pres Presbyterian Church in Brick, New Jersey. And a visitation will begin at 12 p.m., followed by a mem memorial service at 1 p.m. Um, this upcoming Sunday, we have graduation Sunday, which means that if you're in the sixth grade um, and you're going into seventh grade, you'll move up into the teen class. And then if you have, um, if you're graduating high school, you'll move up into the next class, the singles class, I think, or, um, you know, whatever class that is. So, um, and then we have the back to school rally September 3rd, and we're excited about that. Brother Kenny's going to be coming and uh, preaching for us, and uh, it's going to be under the tent, and it starts at 6 p.m., and um, we're excited, and just be in prayer for that. If you want to help out in any way, um, monetary donations will be taken. You can mark it in the on the envelope and go ahead and put it in the um, offering box back there. And then um, if you have any other questions, you can see my wife about that. And then Labor Day Sunday, which is September 5th, um, we will be having a picnic immediately following the 11 a.m. service. We will be supplying hot dogs, hamburgers, and bottled water, but please bring a side or a dessert to share. We'll be having an afternoon service at 2.30 p.m., and um, our missionary, Jim Savali, will be preaching for us. Also, Brother Larry wanted me to mention that after the evening service, we'll be having a softball game over at the field down the road. And uh, if you have any questions about that, you can ask um, Brother Larry. But that's all the time we'll take for announcements. Let's um, just uh, spend some time in prayer, praying um, for the offering and thanking the Lord for providing for all of our needs. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much um, for blessing us and uh, Lord just pouring out your blessing on us and being so good to us, being wonderful and amazing and taking care of every single need. You've never let us down, and that's just an awesome thing that we can praise you and thank you for. And uh, God, we pray that you'd help us in the future as we continue to press forward. We just want to glorify you. We want to serve you. Uh, we want to make a difference in this community. We want, um, God, for your light to be shown um, round about us. And so, God, I pray that you would just continue to provide the income and uh, continue to bless that as we have this uh, time where we kind of think on the offering, and some people may even give their offering. God, I pray that you would just bless. And Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Yeah. 
try to find no breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ. And if you're still with us, we're going to be in the book of Jude. Uh, by the way, if, you're, if you are going to junior camp or if you have plans to go to uh, send your kid to junior camp and you cannot make it to church tonight, um, see Sam after the service and she'll give you the forms that you need um, and give you uh, whatever you know, information you might need for, for, uh, for tomorrow. Um, all right, we're in the book of Jude. And uh, we've been kind of going through very, very slowly. Uh, we've been six messages now in these verses 5 through 7 and 11. And uh, if you look at verse 3, let's look real quick at where we started this whole thing and the whole purpose for the letter. The Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you with a common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So Jude says, listen, I wanted to write about salvation, and that's what we all like to write about. We love to tell the old, old story. We love to give the good news of salvation. It's all good. But he said, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you, to challenge you, that you need to fight for some things. You need to earnestly, and not just fight casually, you need to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So this faith that we have and that we hold dear, we have to fight for it because sometimes um, people will come in who want to corrupt the faith, corrupt the doctrine, corrupt the morals that are taught by principle in the Word of God. And we see that in verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and lasciviousness has this idea of unbridled lust or excess. And we see that in our society. It's rampant in our society. People can't get enough of anything and, and sinful things as well. So turning the grace of our Lord, of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and or the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we develop this uh, kind of a sub-series of messages. Um, that we called characters from the past because there are six illustrations given in verses 5 through 7 and then in verse 11 of Old Testament characters that are used by Jude as illustrations of things that we need to watch out for today. Now again, they may not be exactly the same today as they were then, but principally there are things that happened in the Old Testament that, that uh, Jude is telling us, hey, we need to be careful about these things today. And the first he gives in verse 5, if you will look there, he said, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. So the first thing he warns us against is really a lack of faith, a lack of believing in God. You know, some people have enough faith to believe God as far as salvation is concerned, but they, they, have, they lack the faith to trust God in every area of their life. And these... Um, people of Israel, the congregation of Israel, they trusted God and they, God delivered them out of Egypt. But um, when it came to trusting God to bring them into the promised land, they, they didn't do that. And they, you know, they sent the 12 spies into the land and 10 of those 12 spies came back with an evil report. Only Joshua and Caleb came back and said, listen, we can do it. If God wants us to do this, we can do that. And, uh, but that, that's typical in our Christian life as well within our church. You know, we lack the faith to do what God calls us to do. And Jude warns us about unbelief or a lack of faith. 
And then he talks about fallen angels in verse 6, and it says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. Now these particular angels, uh, we believe are the angels referred to in Genesis chapter 6, and we talked a lot about that in that message. These particular angels are bound, and they're no longer a problem for us today, but there are many other fallen angels out there that are trying desperately to fight against the will of God and the word of God. And so we need to be aware of the fact that there are angels that are fallen angels, devils, if you will, that are causing problems, and they're influencing people to cause problems within our midst. And then in verse uh, 7, he talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner. Notice, giving themselves over to fornication. And that's really the key. So often we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah and we talk about homosexuality, which is definitely proper as far as interpretation is concerned, but it's all types of fornication. Jude is warning us against giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there, he clearly tells us that, uh, you know, fornication, immorality within the church is a big problem. And uh, we need to beware of it. We need to contend. We need to fight against it. And, uh, you know, I've shared this many times, but, um, uh, you know, the, the church by and large, or churches, maybe I should say, uh, by and large, have really thrown in the towel on fornication. Uh, we may, in some cases, hold the line on homosexuality, but we've long since given up almost on preaching against premarital sex or any kind of intimacy outside the bounds of marriage. And God is clear, it's wrong, it's sin. Now again, I have compassion. I may have been guilty, you may have been guilty of this type of behavior in time past, but we cannot disagree with God. Just because we're guilty of something or have been guilty of something, we cannot disagree with God and say it's no longer sin. And that's what some people want to do. They want to say, well, since I'm guilty of it, it must not be sin, and so let's change the rules. Let's change the Bible. No, God says it's sin. It's wrong. And as a church, we need to side with God always. Even if some among us may struggle with it, we still need to side with God and state what he states about it. We need to be clear about what God says. And God is clear that fornication is wrong in any form, whether it be homosexuality or adultery or just, um, you know, intercourse between unmarried people. It doesn't matter. It's still sin. It's still wrong. And then in verses um, 8 through 10, he talks about some of the things that are going on today that that tie in with these illustrations that he's given. But right now we're kind of just focusing on the Old Testament illustrations. Now we'll move to verse 11. And notice what it says there, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. Now we talked about the way of Cain. Cain was a man who offered unto God a sacrifice based on his own works, the fruit of his hands. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, Abel, his brother, Cain's brother, offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. He offered a sacrifice from the flock. It was a blood sacrifice. It pointed to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And basically what Jude is trying to say is that salvation, the message of salvation, is a message of grace through faith, never a message of our works. And, uh, you know, uh, though... Um, Many churches, if you were to look at their, their doctrinal statements, you would see that they believe in salvation by grace through faith. And they're clear about that in their doctrinal statement. Yet if you would ask the average church member, and by this I'm talking about many denominational churches that have been around for hundreds of years, if you were to ask them, how do you get to heaven, many of the members of those churches would say, by being good. And so the message has been clouded. Somehow we... we Though our doctrinal statements might be clear, we still kind of think somehow salvation has something to do with us and what we do. And salvation has nothing to do with what we do. We just receive the grace that God has offered us. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. It doesn't come through the works of your hand. And Cain was offering unto God a inferior sacrifice, a sacrifice that represented the works of his hands, and God did not accept it, and then Cain was wroth, and that was, by the way, a good indication of his fleshly nature, the fact that he killed his brother right after that. And so, anyway, and then we moved on last week to Balaam. Look at the middle part of verse 11. 
And it says, and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward. Now, we talked about Balaam being a corrupted preacher. He was sold out. Uh, he sold out the people of God for money. Uh, Balak, the king of Moab, hired him to curse the congregation of Israel. And uh, though he could not do that, God would not allow it. He did eventually figure out a way to corrupt Israel from the inside. He sent in Moabitish women into the congregation that seduced the men of Israel and, and immorality was brought, fornication was brought into the camp as well as the idols that those women carried with them. They got some of those men to worship the false gods, false idols of the, uh, the Moabites. And so he corrupted them from the inside, but he was a preacher for hire. He was a hireling. Uh, he was willing to sell out the people of God for money. Now, in this last section of chapter, of verse 11, it says, and perished in the gainsaying of Cori. Now, that word Cori, you'll find it in your Old Testament spelled differently. It's K-O-R-A-H in Numbers chapter 16 and other places in the Old Testament. But it's talking about the same person. By the way, some people say, well, how can it be spelled differently? You see that often because the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and then translated into English. The New Testament was written in Greek and then translated into, into English. And so, you know, sometimes you're going to have transliterations, really, where they'll spell something the way it sounds and put it into an English spelling. And they'll do the same in the New Testament. It's just translate, transliterated, and it comes across as different spellings. You see it with Elijah. He's called Elias. In the Jeremiah instead of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. So there are a lot of examples of that. And so, uh, by the way, look at that verse real quickly again. It said, and perished in the gainsaying. That word gainsaying, it literally means a contradiction or an opposition. Um, it's translated, that same word is translated strife in the Old Testament. You remember when Moses came to the rock and uh, remember he was told by God to speak to the rock and he didn't speak to the rock. He smote the rock twice and he got in trouble for that. He lost his temper with the people. Well, God called that the waters of Meribah, or the waters of strife. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this same word that's translated gainsaying is the word used for strife. And so strife, opposition, contradiction, it's the word that's the contradiction, the opposition, the rebellion, if you would, would be the strongest uh, definition of Kore. And again, we see this word, uh, we see this, uh, the, this story that's behind this part of verse 11 in Numbers chapter um, uh, 16. And so if you would, if you have your Bibles, turn there, and we're going to look at Numbers chapter 16, and we'll really spend the remainder of our time there, and talk about Korah and how that ties into what, we're, what Jude is warning us against today. Now, very quickly, though, Korah's problem was that he was not content with the position that God had given him. He wanted Moses' job. He wanted Aaron's job, Moses' brother. And he led a rebellion against Moses and Aaron. He was power hungry. We've got to be careful about that. Some of us are power hungry by nature. Some of us are ladder climbers. Some of us, you know, see something that we want and we go after it. And sometimes we're willing to break rules and overstep God-given authority in order to do that. And we need to beware of that as part of our fleshly nature. And uh, we need to be careful about it. And Korah was that type of a man. Now, Numbers chapter 16, in verses 1 and 2, will give you a little bit of information. And the Bible will give us a little bit of information about who the man Korah was. Notice it says there, now Korah, the son of Ishar, the son of Kohath, uh, we need to know that name, Kohath, the sons of Levi, or the son of Levi. And then it says, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and An, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. So look really quickly at that. You had Korah, who was from Kohath, also from Levi. Then you had Dathan, Abiram, and An, who were both children that descended from Reuben. Now, if you remember the story uh, the Old Testament, the sons of Jacob, Reuben was the firstborn. He was the oldest. And Reuben should have been entitled to the birthright. He should have been the one, I mean, Jesus technically should have hailed from the tribe of Reuben. But Reuben gave up his birthright because he slept with his father's wife 
His father was not happy with that at all, and he forfeited his birthright because of that. Now, he didn't sleep with his, it wasn't his mother, it was kind of like his stepmother. Back in those days, some of these guys had many wives. Jacob had two wives, he had two concubines, so technically four wives, and he slept with one of Jacob's concubines, I think it was Bilhah. And because of that, Jacob was very wroth, and he forfeited his birthright. The oldest was entitled to the birthright, and he did not get the birthright as a result of that. Now, Simeon and Levi were the next in line for the birthright, but they also did something wrong. They slew all the men of Shechem, a city of, of Shechem, and, and they may have had somewhat of a good reason to do that. Uh, the men of uh, one, uh, Shechem, the man Shechem, who was King Hamor's son, he raped Dinah, uh, it, it, uh, Jacob's daughter, and the brothers didn't like that. So Simeon and Levi killed all the men of the village. But the father never told them to do that. And, and, and the Bible says in the book of Genesis that they were instruments of cruelty. And so the, the, the birthright bypassed them as well. Child number four was Judah. And Judah got the birthright. And the, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And so, uh, anyway, there's a little bit of uh, history regarding these sons of Jacob. Well, anyway, the priests in the tabernacle were the Levites. And uh, look what it says there in verse 2. We didn't read verse 2. It says, And they rose up before Moses, and certain of the children of Israel, uh, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And so you have, you have Korah, who's from the family of Kohath, who's of the tribe of Levi, and then you have these other guys who hail from the tribe of Reuben. They're leading this rebellion. They're not alone. There's 250 princes of the assembly, famous uh, uh, in the congregation, men of renown. They're all part of this rebellion. Now, a little bit of background again. The Levites were divided into three families. You had Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And these families were placed in charge of the tabernacle and later the temple. And uh, back in Exodus chapter 6 and verse 16, you see this taught there as well. It says, and there are, these are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generation, Gershom and Kohath and Merari. And the years of the life of Levi were 130 and 7 years. Now Korah descended from the Kohathites. He was Kohath's, Kohath's, the guy's name was Kohath. He was Kohath's grandson, according to Exodus 6, 18, and 21. Moses and Aaron, interestingly enough, also descended from the Kohathites. Okay? They were also the grandsons of Kohath. They were cousins to Korah. So Korah, Moses, and Aaron are cousins. Moses and Aaron, they're brothers. Korah was their cousin. Now, Moses and Aaron were particularly from the family of Aaron. So they descended from Kohath, but Kohath had a son named Aaron. And Aaron, or had a son named, or grandson named Aaron. And the family of Aaron were given by God the responsibility of the priesthood. Aaron was the high priest. His sons were assistant priests, if you will. And they served in the tabernacle. Now the Levites, the other Levite family, Kohath, Merari, and Gershom, they also served in the tabernacle, but they didn't do the same things the priests did. The priest, the high priest, went in once a year and offered the blood of the atonement on the day of atonement for the congregation of Israel and for his own sins. And you had the other priests that offered the daily sacrifices and they swapped out the table of showbread and, and they, all, they offered incense on the altar of incense. They had daily duties and responsibilities they did, but only the high priest went actually in. Now, only the priests, period, whether it be the high priest or his sons, actually entered into the tabernacle to minister. But these other families, they had responsibilities in the tabernacle. And if you, you don't have to look there, but Numbers chapter 3, verses 14 down through verse 37, you can see all the duties of the different families and what they had to do in the tabernacle. Now, in verse 31 of that passage we see what the Kohathites, what their particular job was. In verse 31 of chapter 3 of the book of Numbers, it says, And their charge shall be the ark, that's the ark of the covenant, and the table, and the candlestick, and the altars, and the vessels of the sanctuary, wherewith they minister, and the hanging, and all the service thereof. Now here's what that meant. You, I, as I mentioned earlier, you had the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was made up of an outer court, and inside that outer court you had the tabernacle proper, and it was made up of the holy place 
and then the most holy place, or sometimes it was referred to as the Holy of Holies. Inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the mercy seat. And that's where the blood of the, the atonement was offered once a year. The blood of a goat for the sins of the congregation, the blood of the bullock for the sins of the priest, the high priest, and it was offered once a year. It all pictured the blood of Christ. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin, but it pictured the blood of Christ. And that was inside the most holy place. Then there was... The, the, uh, the curtain or the veil, and that separated the most holy place from the holy place. Now, inside the holy place, which was also covered by various curtains and fabrics and skins of animals, you had the table of showbread, you had the candlestick, and you had the altar of incense. And the, priest, the priests would enter into the holy place to minister daily. Only the high priest could go in behind the veil and only once a year. Then you had inside the outer court, you had the brazen altar, the brass altar, and that's where they would offer the daily sacrifices and the sin offerings and the burnt offerings and all the other offerings that were offered on behalf of the people. They were offered by the priests on top of that offering. And then they had the laver, which was another, uh, it was contained water, and they would wash there. Okay, now... The Kohathites, their job was when God determined by the moving of the pillar of cloud by day or the pillar of fire by night that the tabernacle was to move forward. Remember, they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness and that tabernacle was mobile. It had to move. Now, it would stay in one place probably sometimes for several weeks or even months at a time, but it would move around. And when God said it was time to move around... It was, the, everybody had their responsibilities as far as breaking down the tabernacle and moving it. Now, the, the, it says that the Kohathites' particular job was the ark. Now, they never, the Kohathites never saw the ark. They never saw it. Here's what would happen. The priest would take down the curtain, the veil, and they would cover the ark. It would be completely covered. The ark had little rings in the corners, and they would put these staves inside the rings. And then once the ark was covered, then the Kohathites would come, and they, would, they could never touch the ark, but they could hold the rods, the staves that, that were inside the rings, and they transported the ark. So they moved it. They would put it back in place, but they did not cover it or uncover it, they never saw it. Um, they also were responsible for, uh, responsible for taking down all the other instruments and getting that all broken down and transporting. Now, each of the other tribes had their other functions as well. And so that was their job. Now, here was, was Korah's problem. Korah's problem, he wasn't content just being the transporter of the ark or the guy that took down the tabernacle and moved the furniture. He wasn't content with that. He wanted Moses' job. And the problem was, is God did not give Korah that job. God gave Moses that job. And so he was, he, as we're going to see, the, the verse states, he took too much upon himself. Now look at verses 3 uh, down through verse 19. Look what it says there. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, and said unto them, you take too much upon you. Now this is what they say to Moses and Aaron. Notice what they say, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Now notice what he's claiming here. He claims that all the congregation was holy or set apart by God. And that was a true statement. God had set apart the congregation of Israel and every member of that congregation within it. And, uh, but his claim was that because the congregation is all equally holy, set apart, anybody within the congregation could do any of the jobs designated by God. And so he felt like, well, listen, if we're all set apart, we're all holy, why is it just you that's leading the people? Now, again, the problem wasn't that he was concerned about the congregation not being given the credit that it should be given and not doing all that it could do. His, he, what he really wanted, he wanted Moses' job. So he's putting down Moses and Aaron, not because he's concerned about the congregation and everybody else and this guy's abusing his power and I'm concerned for the congregation. No, he wanted the job himself. So he wanted to put Moses down and elevate himself to that position. And by the way, we, we need to each realize 
that when we talk about people, we run down leadership, things like that, that's what we're doing. We're, we're putting them down, but what we're doing is elevating ourselves. We're not, we're not concerned for the glory of God because we're going against what God tells us we need to do in order to fix things and correct things and all that. We're just running down God-ordained leadership in order to make ourselves look better. And we got to realize that's just part of our flesh. And by the way, I'm not preaching to you. I, I was guilty of this. I mean, I've shared this. Miss Wiedemeyer, you know she comes to our church often on Sunday nights. I was part of the Christian Bible Church, and boy, I'd, I, I, I would have to say I kind of led a rebellion at the Christian Bible Church against Pastor Wiedemeyer back in the early days. I mean, I, I, I tried to justify it because I was standing for right and, and all that, but I was not the pastor of that church. And there were things that I disagreed with. And instead of just leaving quietly and finding a place or maybe trying to encourage and pray that things would change and get better or whatever, I, I could have just left. Or I, but whatever, I, I kind of like would grumble and gripe and murmur. And other people joined my little rebellion, my little sedition. And I ended up leaving and about four or five other families came with me. And uh, I didn't try to get them to come with me, but they just came with me because the damage had already been done. So I had done this. Let me tell you something. There's a principle in the Bible called sowing and reaping. And I believe I have reaped back what I sowed in those days. And I believe that it's happened. You know, I've had a couple of people through the years here that have kind of, you know, rebelled against us or whatever. And, you know, but I always point back to the fact that's what I did to Pastor Rick. Now, I've apologized for it a million times, gotten right with him. And he's with the Lord now. And he was probably my best friend in the world next to my wife before he died. And, uh, you know, we're good friends, gotten it right. Kim Wiedemeyer's a dear friend of ours. I'm just trying to be transparent with you. That's part of our flesh to desire. We always think we can do it better than somebody else. I I'll never forget what Dr. Gray used to say. He said, uh, well, I don't think you ought to do it that way. Somebody in the congregation would say, I don't think you ought to do it that way. He said, well, let's, hey, I tell you what you need to do. You need to come down to this altar at invitation time and uh, get down on your knees and surrender to God to, to, to preach full time. And then we'll take up a sacrificial offering of $1.98 and send you off to Bible college to starve for four years. And then you can come back, take a church and do it whatever way you want to do it. But until that time comes, you're not the pastor. And he used to say that all the time. And I always appreciated that. And I kind of learned that lesson. But I'm just saying this mutiny, it's, it's just common. Listen, we need to discover what God's plan is for each of our lives based upon the gifts that he has given each of us and be content to fulfill that plan for our lives. And if we're going to do that effectively, we're also going to have to stop worrying about or envying God's plan for other people. And God's got a plan for everybody and other people. And all we need to do is fulfill God's individual plan for our lives and stop worrying about whether this guy's doing what he should be doing or not. Let me keep reading here. We're going to run out of time very, very quickly. Um, so it says here, uh, among them, wherefore then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. So now he intercedes for the people. Moses is very gracious. The people are rebelling against him. He intercedes for them. And he spake unto Korah and unto all his company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Notice what he says here. This do take you censers. Now, this is interesting. He, these censers were the things that the priests would bring into the temple with the with the coals on it, and then the incense. The priest offered the incense in the tabernacle. And he's saying, look, if God, if you're all holy, set apart for this job, you go ahead and get your censers, show up at the door of the tabernacle tomorrow, and we'll see who God accepts. And notice what it says, take you censers, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. And it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy, you take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. So they said to Moses, you're taking too much upon you, Moses. He said, no, you're taking too much upon you, you sons of Levi. And Moses said unto Korah, here I pray you, you sons of Levi, seemeth it but a small thing unto you that the God of Israel hath separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself to do the service of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister unto them. And he hath brought thee near to him and all thy brethren, the sons of Levi, with thee, and seek you the priesthood also, for which cause both thou and all thy 
company are gathered together against the Lord, and what is Aaron that you murmur against him? And Moses sent to call Dathan and Abiram. They were the sons of Reuben, remember? The sons of Eliab, which were the sons of Reuben, which said, will, uh, we will not come up. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth? This is their complaint to Moses. They're not complaining about the priesthood. They don't want to take Aaron's place, but they're complaining that life's not as good as they think it should be. Is it a small thing that thou hast brought us up out of the land that floweth with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness? Think about that. Egypt was a land that floweth with milk. I thought there were slaves in Egypt. You brought us up out of here? That land that floweth with, to kill us in the wilderness, except thou make thyself altogether a prince over us. Moreover, thou hast not brought us into a land that floweth with milk and honey, or given us inheritance or fields and vineyards. Wilt, wilt thou put out the eyes of these men also? We will not come up. And Moses was very wroth, and said unto the Lord, Respect not thou their offering. I have not taken one ass from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moses said unto Korah, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron and tomorrow, uh, or tomorrow, and take every man his censer and put incense in them, and bring ye before the Lord every man his censer. 250 censers, all these people that were involved in the rebellion, these princes, these men of renown, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire therein and laid incense thereon. And stood in the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah, notice this, he gathered all the congregation. So now the entire congregation is watching this. They're there. Against them, uh, 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 all the congregation against them unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the congregation. Now God is there. And God's going to give his decision. And so we see what happens here. And it's really, it's a massacre. Look at verse 20. And the Lord spake unto Moses and unto Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation. Moses, step aside. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nuke all of them. I'm going to kill them all. That I may consume them in a moment. And notice what Moses and Aaron do. They fall upon their faces and they intercede on behalf of the people. And said, O God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and wilt thou be wroth with all the congregation? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men. In other words, get away. from God's going to do something to these guys. You need to get as far away from them as you can. And touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram on every side. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children. And that's the shame of it. When we go against God, lead a rebellion like that, we don't just affect us, we affect our families as well. By the way, all the families in the congregation were affected by this. We'll see that in a minute. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them, notice this, of mine own mind. In other words, I'm doing what God told me to do. If these men die the common death of all men, they just die natural deaths, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, in other words, all that belongs to them, all that pertains to them, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking, all these words at the ground clave asunder that was under them and the earth opened her mouth swallowed them up in their houses and all the men that appertained unto Korah and all their goods and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation and all Israel uh, that were round about them fled at the cry of them for they said lest the earth swallow us up also and there came out a fire from the Lord and consumed the 250 men that offered incense so you know all these people uh, uh, you have uh, Korah, you have Dathan and Abiram and their families, and then these 250 men of renown, they're all killed by the Lord. They're massacred by the Lord. Now, something interesting happens in verses 36 through verse 40. They have these censers. They were all told to bring their censers, these little brass metal things that contain the coals. They were offered to God, so they couldn't just take them and do anything else with them. Once they're offered to God, they belong to God. Yet God said they're defiled, so we can't use them as censors. 
And so what they did was they, they, they melted them down, I'm assuming, or they beat them down or something. They made plates out of them. And they actually used them later on to cover, the, it says, the altars. And you had the altar of incense and you had the brazen altar. And so they were used as kind of a covering, a brass covering for these altars. And, uh, but it was just interesting the way they did it. But then God made a mandate in verse 40. Notice what it says, to be a memorial unto the children of Israel that no stranger which is not of the seed of Aaron. God makes it very clear. It's got to be the family of Aaron, not just from Levi, not just from Kohath, but it's got to be from Aaron come near to offer incense before the Lord that he be not as Korah and his company as the Lord said to him by the hand of Moses. Now in verses 41 through 50, and that's the closing of the chapter, the, the shame of it is, and we won't read it, I'll just kind of give it to you in a nutshell here. The shame of it is, is the infection that was caused by Korah and Dathan and Abiram and these other 250 princes, men of renown, they infected the congregation with it. And I shared earlier, listen, when a church goes through a church split, many of you have been through church splits. We went through a church split. The first church we were involved in, um, in, uh, in, in the Ocean, Ocean County Baptist Church, and there was a church split there. And you would think that right after the church split that it was all over with and that it was all done. This, this group t chose that side and left, and this group chose this side and stayed, and it's just all done. But it's never that way. There's still people that are there, they're still there, but they're still not happy about all that happened and they're kind of grumbling and the affection is still there. And one by one, people still continue to leave. It takes a long time before all the smoke clears. So what happens here is, these people, they're upset about what happened. They blame Moses. They, they said, you killed the congregation of Israel. Moses didn't kill anybody, God killed these people. Moses can't open up the ground and swallow up people. God did all that. And these people are upset, and they're still murmuring, they're still griping, they're still not happy about what happened. And what happens to them, a plague comes out of fire, 14,005, again, Moses intercedes for the people. God again says, step aside, Moses. I'm tired of these people. They're grumbling and griping. I'm going to start over. I'm going to wipe them all out. I'll start over with you. And uh, we'll start a new group of people. But uh, anyway... So Moses intercedes for him, and Moses tells Aaron, go in and offer a, a, an offering on behalf of the people, and God does, and the plague is stayed. But 14,500 of the congregation of Israel is killed. And again, this rebellion that started with Satan, really, moved through some people and infected a congregation, affected a whole lot more than just the main parties that were involved in it. And a lot of tragedy took place. Now, what can we, as New Testament church people, as a New Testament church, learn from this Old Testament story? What, how can we apply this to our life? Well, first of all, let me say this and be clear about it. We need to understand that the New Testament pastor is not in the same position as Old Testament Moses. Moses was speaking directly for God. He was a prophet of God. I'm not a prophet of God. I'm not getting my information directly from God. I'm going through the word of God just like you are, just like everybody else is. And so Moses was speaking directly for God, and Moses was the final say in every matter. Matter of fact, the people said, Moses, you speak with us, and we'll listen, but let not God speak with us lest we die. In other words, we don't want to talk directly to God. We want you to get the word from God and then give it to us. And that's the way it was in the Old Testament. Moses was God's official spokesperson. God spoke to Moses. Moses spoke to the people. It's not the same today. The preacher is not a dictator or a lord over God's church. But he does have a lot of God-given authority. And it really, especially in churches like ours, there's a lot of authority given to a a, a, a pastor, but the authority is obviously limited to certain areas. And let me give you some New Testament verses that deal with pastors, okay? First Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says this, the elders which are among you I exhort, whom also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Here's my main job, feed the flock of God which is among you. But notice this, taking the oversight thereof. So, we're not just feeders of the flock. We take oversight over the flock as well. Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, not because somebody's forcing you, 
but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not for money. We talked about that last week, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being an ensample to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's the Lord Jesus, shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So the Lord is the dictator. The Lord Jesus is the dictator. Um, we're under shepherds. Um, we're all assistant pastors, if you will. In Acts chapter 20, in verse 28, Paul is uh, addressing the elders at the church at Ephesus. And he says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. Again, watch this, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing, watch this, shall grievous wolves enter in, from, uh, enter in among you. So there's going to be problems coming in from the outside, just as Jude spoke about, um, talked about these men coming in, uh, uh, crept in unawares. And then he goes on to say this, and among you not sparing the flock, also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And that's exactly what Corey did. Corey did. He was, he was within the congregation, yet he was trying to draw the congregation to follow him. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, again, these are all familiar verses. The Bible says he gave some apostles and some prophets, and we don't have them anymore. Some evangelists, it's a church planner, missionary. Some pastors and teachers, that's one office. There's no comma after the pastors. So it's pastors and teachers. That's the duty of the pastor is to pastor and teach. For, why are they given? For the perfecting of the saints, maturing, feeding of the flock, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Notice that we henceforth be no more children. If we're going to be perfected, we're not going to be like children anymore. What, what, what are children like? Well, they're tossed to and fro carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of man and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. By the way, the stronger the church congregation is doctrinally, the less there's going to be the temptation to be drawn away by one of the wolves from the outside or even someone who's desiring power from within the flock. So in a New Testament church, you know, you have a pastor, but really in a New Testament biblical church, the 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 congregation corporately has the final say under God. It's the congregation that has the authority, not the pastor. And some people balk at that, but if you look at you know, the definition that we give in Baptist history of a New Testament church, we say the will of the local church is final. Now, obviously, the, the local church can't go against God's word, just like the pastor can't go against God's word, but it's the will of the local church. Um, having said that, we each have positions within the local church. The pastor is the spiritual overseer of the congregation. He's responsible for directing and overseeing the ministry of the word of God to the congregation. He's the chief teacher. And as an overseer, he's really the chief administrator as well. And the pastor is called by the Lord, but that calling has to be recognized by the congregation. Usually, in order to vote in a pastor, there needs to be a large percentage of the vote. In our church, I, I looked this up for this message. I didn't know what it was. But in our church, in order to vote a pastor in, 80% of the congregation needs to vote him in. As a matter of fact, uh, a, a strange story happened at, at another church like ours. There was an, the pastor resigned. It was a large church, too. The pastor res resigned. The assistant pastor was candidating for the position. And the congregation really wanted him. He had been there a long time. And, uh, but you needed 90% of the vote in order to become the pastor. And Pastor Clark even said, I'm telling you, if they put me up for a vote right now, I, I couldn't get 90% of the vote. He said, I got people that don't like me. He said, I, I couldn't get 90%. That's a lot. So he, got, he did not get voted in. He got like 88 or 89% of the vote. He just missed it. But watch this. You only needed 75% of the vote to change the Constitution. So they changed the Constitution at 75% of the vote, and they changed it to the fact that they only needed 80% to vote in the pastor, and they voted in the guy they wanted to in the first place. So it was a little bit strange the way they did it, but they did it. It was all legal. But the point I'm trying to make is this. The congregation has the final say on this, and that's a law. It's not just 51% of the vote. It's not like 
politics, you know, between the good guys and the bad guys or the left or the right or whatever it might be in your mind, it's not 51%, it's 80%. You have to be, as a congregation, strongly be behind the pastor. And, and, and the point behind that is this. The congregation has the final say, but they, as a group, chose this guy. They chose the pastor. And because by an overwhelming majority they chose the pastor who was called by God, which they recognized that call, they need to give him a wide degree of latitude in backing him up, even though individually they may not agree with every decision. And by the way, he may be wrong in some of the decisions he makes. He's still human. He's not perfect. He's not God. So in our church, I was voted in by, uh, there was one not a negative vote, but it's, uh, I don't even understand what this is, but it's um, an abstain. I don't understand what the abstain thing is all about. Just yay or nay, yes or no, why, why abstain? But there was one abstain, but everybody else voted. But that was back in the days we had 18 people here. And I, I'm, I'd be afraid to put it up for a vote now to see what would happen, but who, whatever. But, um, but anyway, and then another thing about our church, which is kind of unique from other churches, is, 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 is I can hire or choose anybody that's on the staff. You know, the Sunday school teachers, assistant pastors, whatever. I choose that. We're not, they don't get voted in by the congregation. Now, if we're gonna pay them, the congregation has to vote on their salary or their compensation, just like the congregation has to vote on my compensation. But I choose whoever I want. Why? Because they're my staff. They work with me. And so it just makes it easier. You don't have a guy that is working against you that's, that's you know, in the same ministry as you are. And so it just makes it easier. However, in our congregation, they do choose deacons. But even though the deacons are chosen by the congregation, they also have to have the support of the pastor. Nobody can be voted in as a pastor who doesn't, as a deacon who doesn't have my support. And that's never happened. Well, you know, whatever the congregation decided, I've always got along with it. But, but I'm just trying to say this. The pastor of a New Testament church does have a lot of authority given by God, given by the congregation, and that can be dangerous if he's the type of guy that desires power. If he's the type of guy that wants to lord it over God's heritage, it could be a dangerous thing. That's why you need to be very careful who you choose um, as a pastor. But the other extreme is just as dangerous. If you have a guy that's very, very weak in leadership, who can't make a decision, who wants to make everybody happy, that's gonna be a problem as well because Satan is gonna use that to, to raise somebody up within the congregation that's gonna draw disciples after himself. There's gonna be problems that are gonna come as a result of that. So you do need a strong leader. Now, three quick practical points. Submit to the God-given authorities in your life, but listen to this only within the area that they have authority. And if you're a pastoral staff, Sunday school teacher, whatever you position God's given you, you have authority given you in that area, but don't overstep your bounds. I don't tell people, you know, what, what house to buy, or should they get a car loan, or should they not get a car loan. I don't even tell people who to marry. I mean, there's some pastors I know that it's God's will for you to marry this, but I don't know if it's God's will. I can tell you who it's God's will for you not to marry if it's clearly somebody who's lost or whatever, if I could see something clearly from the scriptures. But even then, I'll only advise you. I'm not God. I'm not the dictator over this church. And many churches in our circles have overstepped their bounds in those areas. And again, I'll give you my opinion if, if I have an opinion on it, but I'm, I'm not going to... I, listen, my responsibility is regarding the ministry of the Word of God at Jersey Shore Baptist Church. That's my responsibility. Now, you want to step in that area and challenge me there, we're going we're gonna to go you know, toe to toe. But outside of that, I'm not going to tell you what to do in your house with your family and all that. That's between you and the Lord, not me. And so only in the area of authority. And we need to submit to God-given authorities in your life. Listen, parents, uh, you, know, you have children. The Bible says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. They're to submit to your authority. Um, uh, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands, unto your own husbands, not somebody else's husband, your own husbands. Um, there's submission there. You're to submit to your boss at work. You know, this business of running down the boss at work and talking bad about him and all that kind of stuff. No, you're supposed to submit to him and, uh, and do what he tells you to do unless he's telling you to do something that violates a moral principle or something that a higher authority told you not to do. 
And we're to obey this, the secular authorities out there, the police and all that. There's all kinds of areas. We're all going to be submissive to somebody, and we're all going to be in authority or in leadership over somebody else, and we need to learn this. I like the centurion in the Bible. I understand authority. I have people under me, and I tell them to do this or go there. They do it. But I also understand you have authority. You don't have to come to my house and heal my servant. You can just do it because you can say the word. You have that kind of authority. He understood authority. We need to understand authority. I like military guys. I'm looking at James over here. James understands authority. He, he was a military guy. I mean, you're used to in the military, you know, whatever. They tell you to jump. You say what? How high? You know, and again, that's not what we're about here in a church, but they understand authority. That's his role. I shared earlier, um, I'm working two days a week for my brother's company. It used to be my dad's company. My dad passed, and now it's my brother's. Two days a week, they're, they're in a jam. They're, they're, they're really short, like everybody else is short of labor, and so they needed help. And so they, they, they really sweetened the pot, made it a good deal for me. But here's the catch. My nephew is my boss. My nephew, who was a kid when I was running the company, is now my boss. And I was in a situation the other day where, you know, I had to call him up that the, the prices weren't getting changed in the stores. I'm looking at my invoice. My invoice says that Brazil nuts for the one pound bag are supposed to be $12.49 a bag because they just went way up in price. And the tag says $9.49. So I said, well, somebody's losing a fortune on this. They're supposed to be selling for $12.49. The tax is $9.49. So I called them up. I said, what do I do about this? There's a lot of prices. They're all wrong. I'm looking at the invoice. He said, look, I've been sending in the price changes. They're supposed to change them corporately. They're not doing it. It's not on us. It's on them. I said, okay. I went to you. I did what I was supposed to do. I told you about the problem, and you told me what I needed. Do I need to do something? Do I need to go to the scan coordinator, try to get a change? He said, no, it's on them. He said, I'll call the guy again at the produce supervisor and see if I can get it fixed. I said, okay. But even then, I couldn't just leave. I just couldn't do that. I went to the produce manager and I said, look, here's a couple of items. These prices are wrong. You're losing money on these items. You might want to fix them. And then, I, again, I left it up to him. You, you do what you want to do. I'm just informing you that there's a problem here. Our company did what we were supposed to do. And so, but it's still, it's a weird thing. My nephew, who's 30 years old and still dripping wet behind the ears, is, he tells me what I can do and what I can't do, but he's my boss. And that's, it's the way it is. And I have to submit to him. And if I can't submit to him, how would I ever expect anybody to ever want to submit to me? You follow what I'm saying? And so we all have this submission in our life. Now, if you are in a position of authority, make it easy for people to submit to you. Be a gracious, patient, compassionate just, but strong leader. Be something somebody can follow. Don't be one of these my way or the highway guys. Work on your people skills. I, I'll just say it like that. Be the kind of leader that people want to follow instead of just whatever. You know, all, all your, the people that are underneath you hate you. Don't be that way. Try to be somebody that people can look up to and work for. Uh, read that book, The Way of the Shepherd. There's a great book for you. Read that book, The Way of the Shepherd. Little book, tiny book, uh, but it's a great book on leadership, The Way of the Shepherd. And then lastly, if there's a clear, blatant violation of authority by leadership, so somebody over you, man, they are just, they are violating something. They're doing something that's clear that God said don't do. And it's, it's a moral violation. It's a doctrinal violation. Then approach the leader first in an attempt to fix the problem, but then and only if necessary, go through the proper channels to fix it. And if you can't fix it, walk away and leave if you have to. Uh, with Pastor Rick, there were some things I was upset about. I don't know, looking back in hindsight, if there were enough for me. It wasn't doctrinal, it wasn't moral. It was standards, things like that. And I was probably over the top in many of those areas. But if it was a strong enough reason, some kind of doctrinal issue, moral problem, and I couldn't get it fixed, couldn't get it straightened out, what I should have done was just walk away, not said anything to anybody, found another church that I could submit to as far as their doctrinal position and all that. I should have just walked away. Walk away, Kyle. You leave it to God. There's a God in heaven. Do we really believe God is in charge? And you know what? If we leave it to God, God will take care of it. I mean, God will take care of it. It's when we try to manipulate things and grab onto things and hold on to things. You know, some of you wives, you're praying 
for, for your husband to get straightened out, but, but you won't take your hands off of him. You're trying to change him, but let God work on him. Pray for him and, wor- and let God work on him. So I'm just saying in these areas, pray for your boss. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your Sunday school teacher if there's something you see that needs to be changed. And if it's that bad, walk away. I'm not saying, there, listen, there are times you need to leave. There's times you need to leave a church. Stuff, sometimes stuff goes on, you can't get it fixed, you need to leave. You need to go to some place where it's going to be good for your family. It's not like marriage. I used to say that. They say your church is like being married. You stay forever. No, marriage is marriage. Your church is, it's close, but it's not there. And there are times that you may need to bail out if there's something really bad going on. And you can't fix it. You do it, you prayed. You didn't backbite, gripe, complain, murmur, but you tried to fix it biblically. You went to them. And then you tried to go through the proper channels. Maybe you talk to somebody else in authority to see if you can get it fixed. And you still can't get it fixed. Then you need to back out. And you need to just trust that God's going to deal with it and take care of it. And that's up to God. It's God's problem. All right, we'll stop there. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much, God, for the instruction that we get through the New Testament uh, book of Jude and through these Old Testament examples. And God, we just pray you'd help us in this area of really rebelling against authority. And I've been guilty. I was transparent. I admitted I have that in my nature. And there's times even today I get jealous of other ministries and what you're doing with other people. And that's all really at the root of all this. And I pray you'd help me with it. I pray you'd help all of us regarding the leaders, the authorities that you've placed in our lives. And we all have authorities in our lives. Help us, dear God, to submit not just on the outside, but on the inside as well to the leaders that you've placed in our lives in the areas that they have leadership. God, I pray you'd work during our invitation for it's in Christ's name we ask it. Let's all stand to our feet. If God spoke to your heart, you want to come and pray at the altar. The altar's open. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. If you're here today and you're not sure about your salvation, even though the message was really for believers. um, If you're not saved, boy, you need to get that matter settled. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, nobody's looking around. Maybe you're here today and you're not 100% sure if you died right now, you'd go to heaven. Please allow me the opportunity of just praying for you. I won't embarrass you, but I will pray for you. I'll include you in my closing prayer. If that's you, you'd say, Brother Phil, please pray for me. I'm not 100% sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven, but I'd like somebody to pray for me. I'd like you to pray for me. Would you slip your hand up? Anybody like that at all? Please pray for me. I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like you to pray for me. Anybody at all? With the uplifted hand. Christian, how are you doing in the area of submission? Wives, I know it's tough to submit to your husband. I know it's tough to submit to your boss. I know it's tough sometimes to submit to the civil rulers we have in our land. Children have a tough time submitting to their parents. They have that rebellious nature. We all do. But God has given us authorities in our life. And we can't be like Korah, leading a rebellion against those God-given authorities. If we're going to submit to God, we have to submit to the people God has placed in our lives. Go ahead, host. All right, let's close out with our chorus. Welcome to race. We'll run the race, we will press on, keep up the pace, don't quit today, encourage those along the way, continue on in Jesus' name, our strength to run is in Christ alone, we'll fix our eyes on Jesus' face, the one who saved us by his grace.